So I wonder what happened to the to the uh, skeleton itself to that effect? Were they still left there, or were they analyzed by physical anthropologists? Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, what happened to the skeletons from the six nomadic burials? When you're down in the, excava uh, in the exhibition, take a look at the wall next to burial number one, and you'll see a wonderful photograph of the uh, excavations in process. You'll see the bones, and you'll see the golden objects. One of the tragedies of the Civil War in Afghanistan was, not only was the National Museum bombed and destroyed, and its roof uh, lost and its collections, luckily its collections were hidden. The Institute of Archaeology, where the bones were kept, was completely demolished. And unfortunately, in that case, we didn't have the foresight to remove the artifacts from the Institute of Archaeology, so the bones are gone. I'm terribly sorry about that. We have a lot of lost in Afghanistan, but we've got a lot of things that are saved, that are people are very, very proud of, and we're using those that are remaining to build for the future. Um, you mentioned that the museum was destroyed. Are there pieces still in the presidential palace and there are plans to rebuild the museum? The question is, uh, is the museum getting rebuilt? And the, question, and the answer to that is absolutely yes. When I went there for the first time in 2003, the, the building, in fact, had no roof and no windows and just a, a bolted door and inside no artifacts. Today, thanks to the international community and thanks to this incredible museum director, Omar Khan Masudi, the building has a roof, it has a security system, uh, some of the galleries are open, and the inventory team that I worked with for those months and months are now completely trained in inventorying their collections and are going through and reestablishing the National Museum. So, Yes, it's open. It's my understanding from the catalog that you were working, or she was working with the old woman by the name of Carla Christie. I know that prior to your arrival, that she came in when the museum was in Shanghai. Was she by any chance present but hidden in, at the actual opening of the uh, treasures? The question is about my dear, dear colleague, Carla Grisman, who was in the picture that you saw of the opening, uh, as was Nancy Dupre, who Nancy Dupre and Carla Grisman are considered the angels of Afghanistan. Uh, a couple of women, both American, both bullheaded and obstinate and incredible, who stayed in Afghanistan during the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, through 2000. Um, Carla tells me about standing on her apartment roof and looking up and seeing these fireworks that were around and having absolutely no fear while the city, 70% of the city was destroyed in, uh, in 1993 and 1994, she went back into the museum to help pick up the pieces after it was looted. Carla was there to do the initial inventories of fragments that were lying on the ground. So in 2003, when we were invited to reopen the inventory of the hidden boxes, the one request that Mr. Masudi had for me was, please find Carla Grisman and have her join her. That was very difficult because if you can imagine that she was there in the 1970s, fast forward 25 years. So I am really honored to have found her in retirement in London. And if you can imagine, I met her at Heathrow Airport, you know, this little old lady, she came and, and I met her at Heathrow and I said, are you Carla Grisman? She says, yeah. I said, you know, we really need you to come to Afghanistan to work in the basement of a bank vault and work eight hours a day, nonstop, for months and months. I said, are you willing to do that? And she said, absolutely. <laughs> she has been there every day for every single day of inventory. She's absolutely part of the heroic team of Afghanistan. So thank you for mentioning her. Oh, great. One of my favorite questions. 
So the question is, when you go downstairs and, and see the treasures of Afghanistan, you don't see very much lapis, which is native to Afghanistan. It's such an interesting question. Where, you know, where's the lapis? It's so interesting that I wrote a book about it. <laughs> it didn't sell very well, I'm sorry about that. So you won't find it in the bookshop. I, I, I called the book Between Lapis and Jade. Um, and you know, we have this fascinating phenomenon that in northern Afghanistan, there's this fabulous blue stone called lapis. And actually, not very far, in western China, there are beautiful jade uh, resources, jade, jade sources, and there's turquoise, which is bluish green, but more on the greenish side. And why is it, if you've got this beautiful blue, do you not see it in Afghanistan? Well, here's the book in short version. Basically, you know, who knows, but I think, <laughs> that's why the book didn't sell very well, right? <laughs> But you know, basically, you know, the lapis got exported out of Afghanistan to the Middle East, and it's sort of like, you know, uh, think about it economically. You know, you, you're going to buy something. What are you going to buy? They didn't buy the green; they bought the blue. Near Easterners love blue. You find it in Mesopotamia. You find it in Egypt. You find it all over the place. And isn't it interesting? In China, in the steppe area, and in Afghanistan, they love green. And this is the stone, bluish green, jade, and uh, turquoise. So it's sort of a structural difference between the ancient Near Eastern cultures that are more bluish and the ancient Asian cultures that are more greenish. And if you like that, I, I will show you on Amazon.com where that book can be found. <laughs> I, actually, it's out of print, so.